Welcome everyone to our Amandia seminar. We have a wonderful guest today. Uh, Dana Galili is with us and she will be introduced by Katrin Vogt. So welcome everybody. Thanks for coming uh, in person and online. And I'm really excited to present today's speaker, Dana Galili, uh, from the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. And she's working there in Greg Jeffrey's lab right now as a postdoc about to finish. Uh, she did her master's in the Weizmann Institute in Israel, working with uh, Alon Chen. Um, back then with mice, uh, neuroscience and mice. And then she moved on to Munich for her PhD to work with Ron Tanimoto on uh, learning and memory in uh, Drosophila and fruit flies. Um, and yeah, from then on she moved uh, to Cambridge. And today we will hear about her postdoc project um, about uh, courtship um, in Drosophila. So the stage is yours. Thank you, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me over and for the introduction. So I will tell you about uh, pheromone processing in the fly brain. And we discovered that this pheromone called CVA, which is produced by the male, is processed in s different parallel pathways by the female brain. One of them is generating a perception of the location of the male, so the where pathway. Another stream of information is processing what is being uh, uh, presented. So that's the what and the where uh, separation in the uh, olfactory uh, processing in the flies. So a little bit about what I think is the brain doing. So um, I'm interested in how the brain is processing uh, sensory information. So uh, this is a sensory scene that I took my son uh, to the climbing gym uh, a week ago. And uh, if you imagine the visual information that I was processing as I was looking on this scene, so let's use that as an example to see how the brain extracts information from a sensory input. So if we're just looking on the visual inputs, in a single scenario, uh, the brain can receive information about the color, the shape, the size, the location, and the movement of the different object um, that we are perceiving. So in this scenario, I've had all of this wealth of information. And from the sensory processing, the brain basically separates uh, the information into separate streams, and each of them is processed individually. And eventually, in order to create a perception or a cohesive um, uh, concept of what is going on, the brain needs to um, converge some of those streams of information. For example, here may be the um, color and the shape and the size, together with maybe uh, information from other senses, like auditory input, uh, to know that what is going on in the scene. So this is my son. And other types of information would then lead to other perceptions. So for example, the movement and the location uh, with other streams of information would be integrated uh, into the understanding that something is descending. That was happening when my son decided to let go of the wall and just uh, descend down. And then after you extract the different streams of information and create those concepts, the brain needs to eventually uh, evaluate how to respond to a given situation. And uh, we do that by converging the information again and integrating. So I need to converge the uh, information from the movement with the information of the shape or the identity to know what to do. In that case, to open my arms uh, uh, to catch him when he was going down. So that is one example of how the brain is extracting information separately and using a lot of divergence and convergent mechanisms. And so I'm interested in the neural circuit of how such a process is happening. Uh, and because I don't want to use my son as a subject, uh, we're using uh, flies, which, is a little bit, which have a little bit simpler brains. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, pheromones. So here is a male and a female uh, silk moth. So this is the first example of a pheromone, which was um, described in the literature. So the male here is uh, sniffing the females behind. Uh, and he found her while uh, flying. And males can navigate from many kilometers away uh, following the scent of a female. And even very few pheromone molecules are enough uh, to help the male navigate. And so in this case, pheromones are used to first recognize the object so that the male would know that this is a female uh, moth from the right species in the right age. Um, and that's what he wants to follow. And also to track the location of the female. And as I said, those males can follow females from kilometers away uh, and find them. So pheromones are used for two, these two separate processes. 
And the pheromone that I am working with um, is a Drosophila pheromone, not a moth, and it's a male pheromone, not uh, a female pheromone, as we just saw. So this CVA pheromone is secreted by a male, and as you can see here, uh, in this image, the, um, it's not very volatile, so it's, it's quite localized to uh, the abdomen of the male or the behind of the male. Um, and although it's an olfactory pheromone, it travels, but it doesn't travel very far. But this was still not yet fully established when we started the project. But it is known that this pheromone leads to uh, very strong behavioral consequences. So it was shown by multiple labs already um, that um, pr uh, the, pre the pr presence of this pheromone is attractive to females and lead females to want to uh, mate with males, whereas with males it has a completely opposite effect. It's repulsive to males and leads them uh, to be aggressive with each other. So this uh, pheromone has sexually dimorphic responses in the behavior of males and females. But because it doesn't travel very far, we were curious to know um, how far this, uh, the effect of uh, the pheromone is traveling and can flies also use the pheromone to localize each other, not only to know whether it's a male or a female, but also to know uh, where the, the fly is uh, located. So we were asking these questions when uh, I started the project. Can CVA serve for localization? How does the brain extract both the positional and qualitative features from a single odor? And how is this information uh, processed in the brain to instruct behavior and focusing on those sexually dimorphic behavior? So here is a fly head. And on the head are the antenna, which are the organ that sends the smell. And maybe you don't really see here, but uh, the first relay station, so the first uh, neuron that uh, received information about the pheromone are receptor neurons that are located on the antenna. And so we wanted to see how these receptor neurons are activated by the presence of a pheromone. And instead of uh, just putting the pheromone through an airstream, we wanted to present a male in complete darkness. So what you see here is a female fly held under a microscope so we can image the activity of the neurons in her brain while putting a male fly on a stick, so it's a micromanipulator, and uh, we can put the male closer and farther away from the female and see how the activity of those neurons uh, in response to the uh, presentation of a male. So this was developed by Ishvan Thais, a very talented PhD student in the lab. And as you see here, um, this is the distance from the female, and this is the response of the neurons using calcium imaging. And of course, the closer the male is to the female, the activity of the neurons uh, is higher. But interestingly, within five millimeters away from the female, there was already no activity in the neurons, which tells us that the CVA range is very short. So the male is sort of walking around with a halo of five millimeter uh, around it with uh, the smell of CVA, which doesn't travel uh, too far away. So CVA is a short range signal for the presence of a male. Next, we wanted to see whether females actually care about being within the range of CVA sensation. So we put here a freely walking female and a decapitated dead male that we glued on the side of the arena. And we wanted to see whether females want to spend time within the range of female sensation, so within five millimeters away from the male. And so we uh, follow them, track them, and follow them around. And this is a heat map of the location of the female throughout 20 minutes uh, of the experiment. And what you see here is that females prefer to be within the range of uh, CVA sensation, whereas males avoid this range and they prefer to be farther away. And this preference to be close to a male or far away from a male depends on intact olfaction because here we used orco mutants, which are uh, olfactory mutants that are impaired in smelling most of the smells, uh, and this preference is gone. So uh, the preference depends on intact olfaction. Next, we wanted to see in more precise how the neurons respond to uh, the presence of a male in different distances and different um, angles around the female. So uh, in this setup, uh, each one is imaging, again, the female. Uh, but this time, the male is free to move around. So we see the male uh, freely moving around the female, and it can court her and go close to the female or farther away from the female while we are imaging the activity of the neurons in her brain. And what you see here is the GCAM trace. So this is the activity of the receptor neurons in the brain. And here below, you see the, um, the distance between the male and the female. And the closer the male goes to the female, we see the activity in the receptor neurons. So this was um, 
reproducing uh, the earlier results that I just showed you. Again, with five millimeter distance, there is no uh, response anymore. And so now not only looking on the distance, but looking also on the angles of the male uh, around the female, um, we plotted here the activity of both the antennas, so the receptor neurons in both antenna, when the male is in different locations around the female. So this is a freely moving male. And we see that the response of the neurons is mostly, is the highest when the male is in front of the female. And if we look on the difference between the two antenna, we see that there is a clear separation that when the male is in the right side of the female, there is mostly activity on the right antenna. And when the male is on the left side of the female, there is mostly activity on the left side of the antenna. And this is a significant difference. So we see um, both a front bias and a lateral bias. This means that there is a contrast between the two sides that tells the female whether the male comes from the left or from the right. So there is a gradient of CVA when the male is freely moving. Next, we wanted to see whether the flies can actually use this olfactory gradient to orient and navigate themselves. So we put two freely moving flies in an arena, and we measured um, the range of CVA sensation, this time excluding the two millimeters around the female, so to make sure that the flies don't touch each other. And we look on the relative orientation between the male and the female. And we wanted to see when the female was inside the range where she could smell the male, uh, when was she starting to make uh, turns to navigate? Um, and where was the male when the female started to turn? And so we see here in a control fly, in an intact fly, these are all the locations of the male when the female started to make a turn. And mostly they started to make a turn when the male was in front of the female, so similar to what we saw uh, in the uh, olfactory responses. And here, we removed one antenna. So we cut the right antenna of the female head, and we saw that she started to make more turns on the left side. So when the male was on the right, she did less turns. And this was uh, also uh, significant when we quantified. So here are all the positions of the males when the female was making a turn. And you see that there is a bias to, do a, to make a turn in the intact side. So the side bias uh, depends on sensing the difference between the two antenna um, to make a turn. And it was similar with males, so uh, both males and females similarly uh, shifted their uh, turn initiation to the side where they could smell uh, the CVA. But we still don't know whether they would then turn towards the male or away from the male when they do smell uh, the CVA. So in order to see um, the directionality of those turns, we put a uh, female uh, on a ball. And this is, again, an uh, experiment from Istvan. And we see that uh, here is a female on an air-suspended ball. And we present the male on a stick again, either from the right or from the left side. And we can measure her uh, movement, so whether she turned towards the male or away from the male. And so doing this experiment multiple times, we see here when we present the male on the right, the female mostly moved towards the male, so to the right. And we present the, female, the male on the left, uh, the females mostly mo move towards the left. So females turn towards the male in the dark. And this was different when you put the light on. So when the female could see the male, she would actually turn away from the male. She would avoid this looming stimulus. But when she couldn't see him and she could only smell him, then she started to turn towards the male. So I showed you multiple um, experiments that um, trying to uh, show the same concept that this pheromone can also use to track the location of a male. So we showed that CVA is a short range pheromone around the male, that females prefer to be within the CVA detection range, and this requires intact olfactory receptors. We showed there is a lateral bias in the neuronal activity that re reflects a gradient in the CVA between the two antennae. We showed that females use uh, the gradient of the male smell between the antenna to orient when they are inside the CVA sensation range. And finally, we showed that females turn towards the male in response to a presentation of the male um, from either side. So all of those experiments show us that the pheromone is also used to track the location. But what is the neural mechanism that is helping with this? So in order to know more about the neural mechanism, we wanted to uh, look into the circuitry. And we do that using uh, the connectome. So this is a very new uh, resource that we have. So here is a fly. And inside, there is the fly brain. And in the connectome, it's uh, an electro electron microscopy volume of images in which we can trace single neurons. And we can reconstruct the entire neuron 
uh, and all the synapse says, and we can then look upstream and downstream of each individual neuron to uh, track in, uh, entire circuits. So we can see, we can reconstruct all of the neurons in the fly brain in this uh, uh, beautiful um, movie by Philip Schlegel. Uh, and so we have now a volume um, of multiple neurons and their morphology and their connectivity. So we have a wiring diagram of a female brain. So all of the information I will show now comes from the female brain. So we focus more on the female uh, part of the story. And so we wanted to know from the receptor neurons, where is the information then going downstream? So we found in a connectome that downstream for the first, from the first sensory relay station from the receptor neurons, the information is diverging into two separate streams. So the two A neurons, the LPN neurons, those are um, found in the literature already uh, a long time ago. So they were known to be responsive to CVA, but we found a novel population of neurons, those two B neurons, which we call LVPN. And we showed that they respond to CVA. So this is the calcium uh, response of those two B neurons to CVA presentation. And they go to separate locations. So while the LPN neurons go to a region called the mushroom body, the LVPN, the LVPN neurons do not go to this region, um, and they, but they go to other regions in the brain and innervate uh, separate areas in the brain. And so what are the roles of those parallel uh, pathways in CVA sensation, in sexual behavior, and in male localization? So here we put two... Uh, um, free flies to interact, so it's a, a male and a female, and uh, we track their activity and we can then see uh, when they were courting each other, when they were mating, how the female was responsive, uh, what happened during the experiment. And so during this experiment and activating uh, neurons in the female brain using optogenetics, we could see, so here the gray line is the control experiment, um, uh, and we see how we look on the female receptivity by measuring, by measuring the copulation proportion. So this is the time, and this is the amount of pairs that have copulated. So you see there is some copulation rate in control flies, and activating the two B neurons increase the proportion of copulated flies, which means uh, females are more uh, eager to mate, so it increases female receptivity, whereas activating two A neurons had no effect on female receptivity. And when we ablated those neurons, ablating two B neurons, reduced female receptivity, while ablating two A neurons had no effect on female receptivity. So in females, only two B neurons control sexual behaviors. Next, we wanted to look on male-male aggression, which is the other phenomena that was shown to be affected by CVA. And uh, we activate pairs of neurons in the male, and we saw that activating two B neurons increased male aggression, while activating two A neurons had no effect on male aggression. And this is an example of two aggressive males that we can measure using the same setup uh, as for courtship behavior. So you see the males are very aggressive. So in males, only two B neurons control uh, aggression, and in females, the same neurons control sexual receptivity. So looking again on the circuit, we showed that two B neurons control female receptivity and male aggression. What about two A neurons? So we thought maybe those neurons control um, localization and orientation behavior. So using the same setup to image the female, while a male fly is freely walking around her, we now image two A neurons, and we saw an even increased lateral bias, an increased um, preference to the front. So here are the responses of the two, uh, the combined antenna from both sides, and it's mostly responding in the front. And here is the lateralization, so how much um, the left uh, antenna responds to the fly on the left, and right antenna responds mostly to a fly on the right. And the lateralization is even uh, stronger than what we have in the first uh, relay station in the uh, receptor neurons. And this was a bit surprising that there is a strong lateral bias, because the two A neurons receive information from the both sides, from both antennas. So we actually expected this to be lower. And so to see further into the mechanism of the lateral contrast between the antenna, we image here from one side while presenting a male fly either on the ipsilateral side or the contralateral side. And when we image from the receptor neurons, we see the response to the ipsilateral presentation of a male and the contralateral presentation. And there is a difference between them, um, which is the lateralization. And this is much stronger when we image from the two A neurons. And you can see here uh, the quantification of the lateralization, so the difference between the ipsilateral and the contralateral response of the neurons. 
And as I said, this is surprising because the 2A neurons combine information from both sides. So we hypothesize that there should be a neuron that is blocking the information that received most information from the contralateral side, which would then um, lead to increase in this bilateral contrast. And so we went back to the connectome, and we indeed found such a neuron in the right location, a lo local neuron. And when we imaged these neurons during a presentation of a male on both sides, we saw that the um, response to the ipsilateral presentation was very low, and the response to the contralateral presentation was very high. So when you receive um, an input from the contralateral side, it significantly uh, uh, blocks the input to the 2A neurons. And indeed, when we blocked the contralateral antenna, the lateralization on the 2A neurons was reduced. So they need the input from the other side to actively block the information and increase the bilateral contrast. So the side bias inhibition by the local neuron increases the bilateral contrast in 2A. And I think this is a very interesting and surprising finding that there is actually a, an active mechanism to increase the contrast so that the flies can be sensitive to very small gradients in this order. Because it's a very short range gradient, they need to be very uh, sensitive to even small concentration differences. So again, looking on the circuit, we found these separate pathways and imaging the activity of these two neurons we see that uh, the response of the 2B neurons to a presentation of a male, so here the male is closer to the female for 10 seconds, and the response of the 2B neurons is activating, uh, they're activated for the entire 10 seconds, so it's a very um, constant activation, which is quite atypical for neurons. So usually you see this sort of response in which there is initial activation and then a decay, like we see with the 2A neurons, but the 2B neurons stay um, responsive for the entire duration when the male is there. So this is a good readout for the presence of a male, whereas the uh, response of the neurons to a male for the 2A neurons is uh, a strong peak at the, uh, at the onset of the uh, male presence, but then it decays. So the 2A neurons are very fit to encode movement and position of the male, whereas the 2B neurons are very fit uh, to encode the presence of a male, whether it's there or not, and it's a very analog signal. Next, we wanted to see how this information is processed downstream in the brain. So we looked uh, in the connectome in the third layer, but then we saw a major divergence, so a funneling out of the information from these two labeled lines. We saw uh, that the information is then going to 40 partners in, downstream to the 2A neurons and 11 different partners downstream to the uh, 2B neurons. And we wanted to check some examples of how different uh, features of this, of the stimulus are being extracted by the third order neurons. So I will just quickly present three examples of how we saw uh, the extraction of different features by the third order neurons. So looking on 3A neurons downstream to the 2A and 3B neurons downstream to the 2B. This is how they look like. The 3A neurons, which we named AV2A2, they are unilateral. And they are sexually isomorphic neurons, so they are similar between males and females. Whereas downstream to the 2B neurons, we found 3B neurons, which are called PC1. These are sexually dimorphic neurons, and they were uh, shown um, many times in the literature that they are uh, necessary and important for uh, female receptivity and sexual behaviors. So imaging the response to a male in these neurons, we found that the response of 3B is sustained. So similarly to their upstream partners, 2B, they keep on responding for the entire duration of the presentation of the male, whereas the 3A neurons are very phasic response to the smell of a male. So again, very suitable to encode movement when something is changing and not the presence of a male. Looking on the sexual behavior, the PC1, the 3B neurons, control female receptivity. This was already shown in 2014 by Zhu from Zoo, um, uh, Baker Lab. Whereas uh, we didn't find, uh, so activating these neurons in females, uh, I couldn't see any increase in female receptivity. So we think that these neurons are less, um, let's say, they have a role maybe in, in female receptivity, but it's not that they signal the presence of the male which is required, but more during the courtship to know where the male is located. And interestingly, we saw that uh, the response of this neuron depend on the speed of the male movement. So here are different speeds when we put the male on a stick closer to the female with increasing speeds, and we saw that the response of these neurons is strongly speed dependent. So 
basically this pathway is um, suitable to encode the position and the motion of the fly, a male fly, whereas this pathway is suitable to encode the identity of the fly, similar to what we know from the visual cortex in mammals, that the what and where pathways have similar, uh, separate uh, processing streams. A third example of a neuron uh, which we found downstream of 2A is called 3C neurons, so ASPG neurons, and these neurons were already discovered in our lab uh, some years ago. They are sector dimorphic neurons, and it was already shown in our lab um, that they respond to uh, CVA, but the circuit was still unknown. So the first thing I wanted to see is whether these neurons um, change female receptivity, and indeed they do, so activating 3C neurons in female um, in females being courted by wild type males, increased female receptivity and increased uh, the copulation. And this was very um, <coughs> surprising to us because the 2A neurons upstream did not increase female receptivity. So, how come the downstream partners have an effect on female receptivity, whereas the upstream partners do not have an effect on female receptivity? So, we went back to the connectome to see whether these in neurons get input from any other pathway. And indeed, we found that the information on 3C neurons is. Uh, it's integrating information both from taste neurons and uh, smell neurons. And so we were very curious what type of uh, taste information can be integrated onto these neurons. And so we turned to uh, collaborators, Carlos uh, Ribeiro's lab, and Daniel Munch from his lab uh, presented different compounds to the proboscis of the females to see what activates uh, those neurons. And he found that male genitals have a very strong activation of those uh, receptor, those gustatory receptor neurons. So basically, these neurons uh, converge and integrate information both from taste and from smell of a male. And I tried to then activate either um, of those channels separately and see if they have an effect on film receptivity. So the orange line is activating only the uh, smell pathway, and again, I see no effect on female receptivity. The green line is activating only the taste pathway, and there is no effect on female receptivity. But when I activate both of the pathways simultaneously, I see an increase in female receptivity, which looks very similar to the increase when I activate the downstream partner. So we think that these neurons have an effect as a coincidence detector, and indeed, when we image them, uh, the response to a male, the response is quite phasic and short. So we think that in the arena, so first we were very surprised because females don't normally taste the male um, during a courtship ritual, but we noticed that, and it was shown already in the literature, that the males leave some deposits of pheromones around the female when they are courting, um, and we think that potentially those, when the female samples those deposits that include both gustatory and olfactory pheromones, then she might, uh, these neurons might become activated and lead to an increase in female receptivity, and so she would then uh, go into a more receptive state, and then she could perceive other stimulation like the male courtship song and other pheromones and tapping in, and the rest of the courtship uh, ritual might be more uh, attractive to her. So finally, I was very curious that we found two separate um, CVA responsive neurons that increase female receptivity, both the 3C and 3B neurons. And I wanted to see whether the increase in female receptivity between this pathway is independent or do they depend on each other. So two possible mechanisms would be if these neurons operate in parallel, then each of them would affect female receptivity independently. And if I would activate one pathway while ablating the other pathway, I could still see increase in female receptivity. Another possibility is that they operate in serial and that um, activation of 3C neurons, so SPG neurons, uh, would depend on PC1 neurons, the 3B neurons, and if I activate those and ablate the downstream partners, I wouldn't see an increase in female receptivity. So I did that experiment to see whether these pathways operate in parallel or serial. So here, um, the purple line is just activation of the 3C neurons, and I see, again, an increase in film receptivity compared to the control. And then the yellow line is ablation of PC1 neuron, the 3B pathway, uh, which, as expected, increased, decreased female receptivity. But here the blue line is activating the 3C neurons while 3B neurons are ablated, and I do see a partial rescue of the phenotype. So there is some degree of independence between those two pathways. So this tells us that, at least to some degree, uh, there is a parallel control of female receptivity by these separate CVA pathways. <coughs> 
And then uh, finally, we saw a surprising effect is that activating these neurons in pairs of females also induced female aggression. So this is aggression between pairs of females, which is quite a rare phenomenon. So these are virgin females, and there is no food in the arena, and there is no reason for them uh, to fight. But activating these neurons, um, maybe perceiving the presence of a male or um, a female which had been mated, lead to increased aggression between those neurons. And recently, it was also shown that activating the 3B neurons, the PC1 neurons, also increased female-female aggression. So it's interesting that these two pathways, which are um, responsible for female receptivity, also lead to aggression between females. And it's not yet clear whether this aggression is something that would be seen in the nature. So how really um, natural is this behavior, or how much it's actually depending on the activation mechanism. But it's interesting to think about the control of aggression and uh, sexual behavior. So it was. Uh, suggested by David Anderson in a review for 2016 that the control of those two behaviors could either be completely separated. So here, some pheromone would lead to the activation of aggression uh, control, while other pheromones would lead to activation of the mating programs. Or alternatively, there could be a, a hub in integrate uh, the different pheromones from the male and from the female uh, together with internal state and other sensory cue and this hub would then be able to lead to both aggression or mating and then you could sort of shift the output depending on the internal state and depending on the sensory cues to either of those uh, aggressive or mating behavior. So based on my results, I think that it's more probable that there is a shared pathway for female sexual behavior and aggression. Although I have to say that the more we go into the connectome and the deeper we dig and separate the neurons, we see that even a small population such as uh, the 3B or the 3C neurons is actually composed of se separate uh, subtypes. So it could be still that distinct subtypes within a neuronal type can promote distinctive behavior. So this is still uh, future work. So to conclude, um, I showed that CVA plays a double role. It contributes to both immediate immediate spatial orientation, that's the uh, where pathway, as well as to long-term sexually dimorphic behavior, that's the what pathway. We saw that CVA uh, is used as a positional cue via an active mechanism of side bias inhibition between the antenna that enhances the bilateral contrast and enable the flies to uh, encode the direction of the male um, uh, in the environment. And we, I showed a few examples of feature detection in the third layer. We showed a, a speed sensor for the male approach that is uh, responsive um, to different speeds of the male movement. We saw tonic responses to the presence of a male, the PC1 neurons and also the 2B neurons. Um, and we saw multisensory coincidence, coincidence detection of a chemosensory scene, these neurons that uh, incorporate both the taste and the smell of a male. So there are multiple uh, from this single pheromone, which seems to be a very uh, maybe primitive or, or a simple response, uh, we can detect multiple streams of information and, and each of those leads to a separate uh, um, property of the stimulus which is being encoded in the brain. And so um, I would like to thank uh, all the people that have been part of this project. So uh, of course, uh, uh, Greg Jeffries and Ishvan who did all the imaging experiments and all the other people in Greg's lab who have been extremely supportive. The Champagne Limon um, Institute, so Carlos Ribeiro and Daniel Munch who did the uh, taste um, imaging, so imaging of the taste neurons. Uh, the people from the Drosophila connectomics who have traced all of the neurons I showed you manually before automatic tracing was uh, a thing in the field. So that was a lot of hours of manual tracing all of the neurons. Uh, Eric Cooper and Kenta Sahina from David Anderson's lab who helped me to set up the behavioral arena when I just started this project. And these people from the fly community for providing fly stocks. And these are my finding funding agencies. And thank you for listening. a lot for an amazing talk and a lot of great data. Um, are there any questions in the room? Yeah, Yannick? Thank you. Um, so I, I would have a question regarding like the nature of CVA and like the very first experiments you showed us with the small arena. Um, mm -hmm. So 
does, act, does CVA act like a, some sort of honest signal that is attracting the female? And how come it's actually like repellent to the male? Because I mean, this would be like the perfect perfume, right? If it's attracting females and repelling males, if you are a male. So, sorry, what? Oh, you, sorry, it's, 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 it's a little bit <laughs> sorry, I'm um, the... um, so, so the very first experiment you showed us with like the, the glued headless um, mm -hmm. male, right? So the right? first experience with yeah. the, where I saw that the females are, they want to be within the range of sensation. Exactly. Yeah. And, the, and the male is actually avoiding it. Yes. So why is the male avoiding it and why is it attractive to females? So, um, so the, the first the first and second layer in the connectome are similar between males and females. So the receptor neurons and projection neurons are the same. But then in the third layer, so the two examples that, of neurons that I showed you in the third layer are sexually dimorphic. So actually, the 3C neurons and the 3B neurons are sexually dimorphic. So in the male, actually, those 3C neurons, they exist, but they don't receive any olfactory information. And uh, in the male, the 3B neurons a homologue of those neurons exists called P1, and it also controls male sexual behavior, but it's a different uh, um, circuit, which is something we are now looking on also in the male. So I, I and we also, um, a paper from our lab in 2016 found that there is another pathway. So there is a switch in the connectivity downstream of the uh, CVA projection neurons in which the information in female flows to one type of neuron, which are the 3C, the ASPG neurons, whereas in the male, the information uh, flows to another type of neuron, which is called AS ASPF. And so those separate streams um, of processing would then lead to different behaviors and to different outputs. So while the input is the same, in the brain there is a switch in the connectivity, which would then lead to separate behavioral outputs. Does this answer the question? Yeah. yeah, and uh, do you also know what CVA, CVA actually signals about the male's state, for example? Um, so it, the, it's age-dependent and it's species-dependent, obviously. So um, it, I would assume it signals that the male is fit because the older the male is, the more CVA it will have. But I don't know to say whether it's uh, increased when the male is... So, and for example, after mating, so if the male is uh, copulating with multiple females, they will have less CVA on them. So it would correlate to the fitness and to the reproductive state of the male. But I don't know to say if a male would, like if you take two males in similar age, whether one of them would have more CVA and that means that it's better. This I don't really know. Um, yeah. Do you think... Do you think the 3C neurons can be descending neurons or un, maybe? The 3C neurons? Yes. They are not descending neurons, uh, but there are some descending neurons downstream to them. So we looked also on the mechanism downstream. So what is happening when the information reaches 3C neurons? And actually downstream we see convergence with other sensors as well. Uh, and the information diverges even more. So if we thought it's divergent between second and third, it's even more divergent in the fourth layer. Um, yeah, so some pathways are shorter and leading to descending neuron to descending control onto the VNC, um, but it's not uh, entirely direct. We're still looking into that. Um, on the intensity of this particular signal, do you think it changes according to the time? The time of the day, you mean? Yeah, and also during the courtship, and that, do you think that might affect the movements? So CVA, I think it's quite stable during the courtship ritual, but of course it's, uh, it signaled the distance, so the female has to be very close to the male in order to sense it. And during the courtship ritual, the male would go behind the female and start following her around and then it's doing a dance so it's uh, circling around the female and it's singing to her so it, there is the courtship song and tapping her so he will stay quite confined within this range where she can also smell this uh, whether it changes during the day I don't know. So the uh, flies would normally mate mostly during dawn and dusk so the beginning and the end of the day I don't know if anybody looked whether CVA would directly be 
circadian regulated. I know that with other insects, it is true that pheromone secretion is regulated by circadian rhythm. I don't think so everybody has looked directly on that. Thanks. Thanks, great talk. Uh, I have a question about this contrast enhancement. Um, I'm just wondering, you show that this, you have this, I think the second layer, they get input from both sides, but then it's inhibited even stronger from one side. Mm -hmm. It seems a bit of a waste to send an axon all the way across the other side of the brain just to inhibit this input later. Do you have any idea why they get this double input? So the structure of the ORN, so the receptor neurons, to the projection neurons, this is true for the entire antenna lobe, so for all the glomeruli. And I think the way to increase the bilateral contrast could be like a valve, like a gain control that you could also switch and modulate in, in different scenarios. And interestingly, we see that uh, this, this neuron, the local neuron that increases the contrast, it's a huge neuron. Maybe I have even here a... Yeah, so if you see here, that's how it looks like. So it innervates the entire antenna lobe, but it acts uh, separately in the different compartments. So um, it, it's really built as multiple compartments, like multiple very small circuits within this one massive um, neuron. So actually, it is quite uh, energy saving because it's a single neuron that innervates the entire antenna lobe, but it operates instead of multiple neurons. So one neuron can do this, uh, change the contrast between the sides for multiple neurons. And what we see here, this information from the connectum, uh, we looked on how much the input be is, is lateralized between the sides, so how much this neuron received uh, input from one side and not the other. And looking on the different glomeruli, it innervates, so different parts of the antenna lobe uh, that is innervated, and we see that DA1, um, so the glomerulus that receives the information from CVA, um, there is maybe five times more connections from the contralateral to the ipsilateral side, but it's not the only one. So there are a lot of other glomeruli that also have similar laterality. So they receive lateralized input from these neurons. So we think that these neurons um, might increase the bilateral contrast across different glomeruli. So actually, it's, actually, it's quite a uh, concise mechanism to control the um, bilateral contrast between multiple glomeruli using a single neuron. Thank you. I mean, first, I was going to ask you about the same neuron. So uh, is this, this one type? Have you discovered in the connectome, or do you expect several uh, similar types of uh, LNs uh, covering maybe different inputs? So for the, those PNs, so for those type, for those PN that um, we, there are two types of local neurons that uh, give information, but only one of them is lateralized. Mm -hmm. And that's why we went on and looked okay. into it and saw that it's um, innovating a lot of glomerulus mm -hmm. where it could have the similar effect. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's obviously not the only mechanism mm -hmm. that exists. Yeah. So there could be yeah. multiple mechanisms. Yeah. And I'm just curious, uh, since you mentioned um, for multi-sensor integration, uh, focusing on olfaction and gustation, uh, what about vision? Uh, what's the uh, input of uh, visual circuits into the system, or where do they uh, converge? Yeah, so all of those experiments we did in complete darkness. It's why I didn't mention that. Um, once you turn on the light, the olfactory input is uh, less important. So they use the, the vision would sort of uh, overtake. Uh, so to really see the effect of olfaction, we do the experiments in the dark, which is also better representative of natural behavior of the fly, which, as I said, the courtship rituals happen in the dusk and in the dawn, where it's not very well lit. Um, so vision will be integrated downstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dana. Wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to read out a question from the online audience. Uh, this is by Giovanni Galizia. Is there any change in the response after mating? That is, during the time the males are not that responsive anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So I looked on the responses of some of those neurons following mating, and they did not increase female receptivity anymore. So we think this circuit operates only when it's virgin females. We do know that the uh, three B neurons, so the PC1 neurons, receive information on the mating status of the female. So this entire circuit would shut down when the female is mated. This is, this is happening. So the mating control uh, changes the three B neurons. With three C neurons, I don't know where the mating effect takes place, whether it's directly on the three C neurons or downstream. But I do know when I activate those neurons in mated females, I don't see increase in remating. So they refuse to mate. Even when those neurons are activated, they would not remate. So I'm assuming it's happening downstream to the three C neurons that the mating switch blocks the output of those neurons. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I also have a question, maybe the last question. Um, uh, so I was wondering, in the last slide, you mentioned that there's also female pheromones. So do you, I guess we know how they're sensed. And do they also, does this information also get integrated into these pathways? Or do we not so what know What did that? I say about female pheromones? <laughs> so there's male and female pheromones. and. I wasn't sure if you mean it's both CVA on the male and female, or if you talk about other pheromones that are released by the female. For aggression? Or what? Yeah, in the last slide. Uh, yeah, male-specific pheromones. Oh, I see. Um, so there are female-specific pheromones, but those neurons, I don't think they would integrate. We don't see response. So if we, instead of presenting a male on a stick, we present a female on a stick, those neurons do not, are not activated by female. So this was actually a control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless it's mated. If the female is mated, then she smells like CVA, and then those neurons are activated. But um, unmated females don't have a, a response in this circuit. Um, first of all, it's really impressive how useful the connectome is. Yeah. <laughs> it's un incredible. And probably the 2004 paper where, where you said they found those neurons already, this must have been through massive screens. Um, the 2014. There was some 40 and some older yeah. paper. So they, they um, um, express double sex. So there are two uh, genes, the double sex and fruitless in the fly, which uh, control the morphology of sexual dimorphic neurons. So by looking on fruitless or double sex specific neurons, you could already detect the neurons which would be important, but we don't know the connectivity. Yeah. So the connectome is very, yeah, it's, it's a game changer. If the moment we that you can really the start with, and then it only comes down to having specific lines for whatever neuron you find. Yeah. Um, but my question is to, so you described the uh, where and the, the, the what? what pathway, yeah. and you find the convergence of gustatory and olfactory information in the where pathway, right? Yeah. Um, somehow, wouldn't it actually make sense to have it in the other pathway? It, more importantly, that you're combining gustatory and olfactory information to know what's going on and if it's the same species. Yeah. And may, I mean, it just makes so much sense to have it there. May you have you missed it in the connectome? Um, so there are many other pathways we didn't check, right? Because there are 40 downstream neurons to the 2A and 11 downstream neurons to the 2B. I'm sure there are more other properties of the stimulus which are encoded by those pathways. Um, but looking on the, those ASPG, so those uh, sensor, the integration neurons, mm -hmm. they receive information which is temporal. So the 2A um, activity is phasic, so it has a, an on peak and then it decays. And I think this is necessary for coincidence detection because if the information will always be there, then basically it doesn't matter when the taste also happens. But in order to have a coincidence detector, you want to be sensitive to changes and not to ongoing activity. And so maybe the term where, um, so the information which is phasic is suitable to encode location and movement and changes in time. The information which is static is suitable to encode events that are ongoing, right? So you can, you know, you can use it to extract a lot of different perceptions. Mm. And one of them would be coincidence detection of two events that happen at the same time. So you need this temporal effect, this phasic effect to have mm. a coincidence. 
Um, and also, the second um, layer isn't yet part of the what or where. It's the beginning of the separation, but it's really only in the third layer where you can have this separation. We can have neurons which are sensors for speed or sensor for location or sensor for male presence. Um, we also showed that the information from the 2A, I didn't show it here, but the information from the 2A is enough to uh, decode the exact location or the uh, angular position of the male. Um, so this was in a, in a really beautiful experiment by Istvan, where he presented the male in either of those locations um, around the female. And we see always a, a difference between the left and the right. And using the difference between the left and the right activity on these neurons, uh, we could build a model that could accurately predict the angular position of the male. So the information in this neuron is, is enough, but whether the brain uses it to really detect the position of the male, yes or no, we don't really know how this is done. Yeah. Why well, do you need coincidence detection in the taste pathway? Because I mean, when you touch it, you know it's there, right? So what, what we predict is that um, when the male, male is secreting those uh, deposits, and the female get in contact with those deposits, then it's the co-occurrence of the male smell and the male taste which would um, increase. So if she only smells the male, maybe the male is a little bit around her, but there are some signals in which the co-occurrence of two, th two things would is a different sensory um, scene. So that could be used to, to, for different um, behavioral responses. Okay, any more questions? No. So, thank you, Dana. Thank you. And um, yeah, let's go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay.